So see when it says start webinar, that's what you click on. Okay. I guess so start letting I'm... people. I don't want to unmute yet. We don't keep it on. But it's still, we're, we're not we're in, in a the practice real, yeah, session. We're in the yeah. We're in practice, yeah. Well, okay. Um, so should we just start I, it? I want to be muted, like, while it's yes. starting. Yes. Well, yeah. you want to be muted. Keep staring at the
Hello, online people. Um, Dr. Cunnan is here and uh, his history with, with Dr. Shah and with the Institute is truly remarkable. I'm not gonna go into details too much. I do wanna reiterate a couple of things. So usually as a scientist, you don't wanna have people stand up here and talk about you when you're standing there, but it is what it is, so I'm sorry. When you, when you do something in science that's worth publishing, you publish it. And generally when, it's, when it's, you know, it's good information that appeals to a lot of people, then they'll cite that in their own paper. They'll say, this work was really good. We followed their model, we used their data, we integrated it into our data, and it creates this really amazing system by which scientists are supporting each other. And, and the number of citations usually tell you how important your work is because it shows how many people are utilizing it in their own fields. Uh, the last two PhDs I worked for were monsters in their fields monsters. If I combine their citations, they're a third of his. There would have to be 133 Charlies for one of Dr. Cunning. <laughs> a, I'm a failure. And B, it just speaks to, you know, when I honor you, I'm honoring Susan because Susan and you work together so incredibly and that's not a fluke. Like people find each other, similar people find each other, passionate people with character find each other. Um, so, more, more logistically speaking, he's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. Very interested in understanding sources, pathways, distribution of persistent organic pollutants in the environment, something that Susan did very, very often. Uh, he looked quite a bit at human biomonitoring and exposure assessment, which is a big deal. It's really easy to go to the environment and say, I found something dangerous. The next question is always a really difficult one. So what? What's it doing to us? What's it doing to the animals, the planet? It's incredible work. He is one of the, the one of the top five most highly cited researchers in his field in the world. In the world. Wow. Awards and yeah. <laughs> Awards and honors that I can't even list right now because we'll be here the rest of the night. Um, and, and again, the, the projects that they embarked on together, working with firefighters to see where they were getting cancer from, is so from the flame retardants and, and the foams that they're using, connecting that to the environment, looking at seals, looking at salmon. It's just, it's an incredible environment of research, start to finish, that is really unique for me. I, in all of my years, I haven't seen anything like this before. So I'm, I'm truly honored to have Dr. Cunnan here, and, and I'm excited to learn as much as you all are about to. So please welcome Dr. Cunnan. Thank you, Charlie. That's really uh, nice of you um, uh, with the very, uh, I think, uh, liberal introduction about me. Um, thank you all for coming here uh, today. Uh, in fact, uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's 20 years in ma making. I have been collaborating with uh, Dr. Susan Sa for 20 years, and she has been kind of always, always inviting me to come here to give a talk. It didn't happen. Unfortunately, but it has happened after 20 years. So my visit to Blue Hill is, uh, is 20 years in ma making. Uh, and, and I'm glad to be here. And thank you all for coming. So today my talk is going to be about um, my collaboration with Dr. Susan Sa. Uh, it's not more about my, the work that I do. It's more about how we collaborated, what we accomplished, what made us to be successful and as Shaw Institute now, what can be done to keep this going and make it even more impactful? That, that's what my talk is going to be. I'm not going to talk much about what I am current, currently doing in terms of exposure, looking at chemical exposure and disease in people. As you can see, I'm, I'm a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and also environmental medicine. So I do a lot of environmental research. This field is gaining a lot of um, interest among uh, physicians, medical doctors are interested in environmental chemical exposures. Because now we know that chemical exposure plays an important role in human diseases. Sometimes they exacerbate the, the health conditions you already have. Chemical exposures, we now know that uh, play an important role in, uh, in our health. Maybe it got stuck. Let me see. Oh, good, it, 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 it takes some time. So I make 
I actually, I started collaborating with uh, Dr. Shaw. I call her Dr. Shaw all the time. And she called me Dr. Cannon. Usually we go by first names, but we had mutual respect for each other. And that's how we, we were all the time, uh, 20 years. Um, so I, I remember in 1999, I contacted uh, Dr. Shaw uh, because at the time it was called Marine Environmental Research Institute. I was doing a lot of research with, with marine mammals, uh, fish, and also uh, oceanic birds, albatrosses, all kinds of things. Because if you measure chemicals in those animals in remote areas, that tells you something about how widespread the chemicals are in the environment. And when you show that kind of data to uh, you know, the policymakers, that gets some attention immediately. Oh, these chemicals are so widespread. That's what we did with PFAS. So in 2001, many of you now know PFAS. These are the chemicals used in nonstick cookware, firefighting foams. If you have a military base near you, uh, you know that, that has probably contaminated uh, the local drinking water supplies there. So, uh, you know, in 2001, we were looking for PFAS chemicals. Um, at the time, 3M company was the one that was making perfluorinated compounds in many different applications. Scotch guard, uh, you know, Gore-Tex kind of, kind of clothing. If, it's, if you're a skier, you mm -hmm. wear a water resistant clothing, all coated with perfluorinated compounds. So then at the time we first reported, yes, PFAS is found in fish from the Great Lakes. Okay, it, it's, uh, you know, Great Lakes is known for contamination. A lot of industries, it's local pollution. Then we looked at dolphins. We found PFAS. They said, okay, maybe it is closer to the continental area. That's why they didn't make the industry make any regulations or policies or, or phasing out or something. We went to polar bears. We measured them in polar bears. We told them that your chemicals are in polar bears from the Arctic Ocean. That's when they said, okay, even before EPA or other you know, federal agencies told them that you have created a big mess, we have to fix it. 3M said, we are facing out. So sometimes these kinds of research, you know, looking at chemicals in marine environment, remote environment, can get the attention of, of politicians, of course, the public, that, that's one way of communicating with them. That, you know, your chemical has reached even the remote areas. Polar bears are exposed, penguins are exposed. The eggs of penguins have chemicals that we use in continental areas. That, that tells you something. We have contaminated the global environment with all those chemicals that we use in our daily lives. That, that's how we started. So I was contacting Dr. Shah, you know, in 1999, looking for some marine mammal samples. Sometimes we say, oh yeah, you, you take the samples, but it's not easy to get those kinds of samples. Where will I go get the samples? I'm a lab scientist. I, I work in a lab with all the machines, you know, measure trace levels of chemicals we are exposed. Then when we want to look for those chemicals in remote environment, I'm looking for samples from remote areas, polar bears. Whom should I contact to get uh, polar bear tissues? And when I contact them, they are, you know, sometimes they, you know, they don't want to share samples with you, some. And some, yeah, we collect samples, uh, like Inuits, you know, they have uh, subsistence hunting. So every year they are allowed to harvest 40 or 50 polar bears. So that's one place where you can go. There is subsistence hunting in Alaska. And then they say, oh yeah, we, we harvest the meat and we throw away everything. We don't keep any, any of the samples. Sometimes those samples are very precious for us because analyzing those kinds of specimens for chemicals that we use in our homes can tell you so many different things. I contacted Dr. Shah. You know, I'm interested in some marine mammal samples because you, you are the director of a marine environmental research institute. Oh, Dr. Cannon, we don't collect any samples. I'm sorry, but this is really something interesting for our institute. Maybe in the future, we, we want to pursue our research in that direction. 
that's fine. So we, we kept in contact. We were, then the Salman study came, you know, in those years, 2001, 2002, a lot of interest in Salmon uh, contamination, chemicals in Salmon. We all know Salmon is good because of omega-3 fatty acid. So the industry markets them, you know, it's good for your health. We pay a lot of money to, you know, get Salmon. And, and of course the industry is also, uh, it's, it's a very big industry. Uh, so now if you look at uh, the Salmon industry itself, it's 30 to $50 billion industry annually. So it's, it's a huge industry and the salmon consumption is increasing uh, in the country because of the benefits associated with it. So in 2001, th there were some publications saying that salmon is contaminated with PCB. Didn't get a lot of attention at the time, but at the same time, Alaska is going through some decline in salmon uh, industry. The, the salmon industry was not doing well in Alaska at that time, for the for, for five years at the time, you know, 19, late 1995 to 2002. So then there was a study supported by uh, Pew Charity, Charitable Trust at the time. It's a large scale study, global study. What they did in that study was that to collect uh, salmon from 16 different cities throughout the world, in you know, major cities, mostly Western Europe and uh, uh, the US. They found the farmed salmon contained much higher levels of many chemicals uh, compared to wild salmon. And also they showed that salmon collected from the Pacific coast is less contaminated than the salmon from the Atlantic coast. That created a lot of debate still. Uh, you know, among, of course, the salmon industry is big. Um, uh, so those days, it, it was a big, uh, you know, topic for those who were uh, working on marine pollution, marine environmental research. Of course, as, you know, people working on uh, exposure, we are also interested in exposure uh, of people eating farmed salmon, right? So that was something that we started, you know, with Dr. Shah at the time. Um, so the, the study was published in 2004 in Science magazine uh, that got a lot of friends in media all over the place, you know, interviewing people. From Salmon, or is, is Salmon from Maine safe? Is Salmon from Canada good? Uh, are, you know, all, all kinds of questions. So this study was a very broad study. They didn't kind of get into the details of why, you know, what form, what kind of practices make the form solvent contaminated. So that study received a lot of criticism also. They thought that, you know, the Global Seafood Alliance is the seafood manufacturers, you know, the big industry. They were kind of bombarding, you know, that study published in Science in 2004 by Heights, uh, you know, Ron Heights and this group. Uh, then we kind of, at the same time, Dr. Shaw was also started thinking about it while they were collecting samples in 2001, 2002, and the paper got published in 2004. Dr. Shaw started collecting samples in 2003, 2004, around that time for us to do an independent study, but more focused study focused on, you know, the samples from Maine, Canada, uh, and also um, uh, from the, you know, the West, uh, East, uh, uh, from Alaska. Uh, and of course, we also collected some organically formed salmon because this study did not have organically formed salmon. So we wanted to add one more thing to see if that will make any difference in our study or not. So they, you know, this particular study led to consumption advisories. People were told if you eat more than one salmon per month, from wild salmon, you are at risk from developing cancer. If you are eating farmed salmon, you should not eat one meal every two months. You know, sometimes salmon lovers, we think we, it's healthy, right? Uh, I, I would rather love to eat every week if, if there are no contaminants, but then the consumption limit, you know, advisory led to uh, us believe that you cannot eat more than one meal every two months. 
with with foam salmon. So, uh, so these things all led to you know more detailed study. That's what we did here, you know, with uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, with Dr. Shah. Um, the first study again we published this in 2006, two years after that global study that that received a lot of controversies. Uh, we wanted to be very focused. And we want to make sure that uh, our interpretation is not biased in any way. We want it to be very clear. That is one thing I cherished. I enjoyed working with the Dr. Shah. It was always that we, we didn't have any hidden agenda with, with our work that we did. It was always straightforward, very clear message. And even the way that it was presented, I'm sure many industries were trying to find some issues, but the way that we presented, it was very clear. How can we go and say something bad about this study? That's how it was. So again, that, those are the things I really enjoyed, you know, working with Dr. Shah uh, in, in many of these projects. So again, this study looked at, uh, if, if you can see, I know some of these uh, slides are crowded, but I, I just wanted to uh, show a few things here that, you know, samples from organically formed salmon from Norway. So they said it's organic farm. Okay, we use only diet for the fish that is derived from vegetable oil, free of PCBs, that's what they said. Um, and of course we measured them for PCB. We had uh, two farms in Maine, uh, farm one and farm two. We had nine farms from uh, Canada, and also we had wild salmon from Alaska. And you can see PCBs, DDT, the pesticide, legacy pesticides, chlordanes, hexachlorocyclohexanes, hexachlorobenzene. Clearly, the organic, organically formed salmon from Norway had the highest concentration. We paved premium price for organically formed salmon, right? And it had the highest concentration. And then, uh, you know, then Maine, Canada, and Alaska, obviously the wild salmon from Alaska had the lowest concentration. And between farms, also there are differences because the previous study, the 2004 study did not get into the details. But when we did the study, Dr. Shah, that's what he's very good at wanted to get into the details. She wanted to be thorough. She wanted to know everything about it before she went out and talked to the public about what she was doing. Uh, that, that was one great thing about you know, working with Dr. Shah. So again, between farms, there are differences. You can see the stars to show the significant differences in concentrations between farms. Why? It is because of the farming practices of raising salmon, uh, what they feed to the salmon can make a difference. So unless that information is known, sometimes you know, we don't know as consumers, we just go, oh, it's organic salmon, this is what I want to buy. My son, he will not touch farm salmon. He will, if you say organic, he will go there and, and pay double the price. Then here, what 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 is the difference it made? It, it in fact had much higher concentration of PCBs and DDTs than even conventionally formed salmon, right? So this created a lot of problem for Norwegians, Americans saying that our fish, Norwegian fish, is more organically formed fish contaminated more. So they they kind of I I mean went uh, what's going on here? Uh, of course, they were trying to look at our data, scrutinize everything, what we did. They didn't find any fault with our data. So that's what I also teach my you know, students. When you do good science, you need not have to be afraid. But when you do something, do very good. Make sure you do very high quality work. Then nobody can do anything because things that we do can be very politically, you know, tweaked in a way that people want to see. But if, if you do a good science, you're, you're very strong. So that's, again, the Norwegian industry was very upset about our publication. How is that possible? 
they they went back they did they did find the same problem what did they do it was because of the labeling mistake that they made so they were raising i mean the salmon were raised in a farm of course probably they had they had organically raised um, salmon in certain farms they were sending it to a processing plant and the processing plant went out of business at least during the time when we were doing the study like four or five years and they kind of there, there was a change in ownership that owner was getting salmon from uh, conventionally raised salmon and labeling it as organic salmon and that came to the us so it was mislabeling that the norwegian industry acknowledged later that it was their mistake and it was the message of course clearly informed um, to dr shah then anyway so i i will tell a little bit about it we did you know uh, salmon with skin on and skin off we didn't see a big difference so so the conventional th 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 thinking is that if you eat skin it has lots of chemicals so we basically tell people remove the skin and eat without skin because that way you can reduce exposure to chemicals but in this study again more detail because the 2004 study did not do all these kinds of things the skin removal doesn't really reduce contaminant concentration okay it's because the chemicals are accumulated in the muscle tissue not really in the skin fat so if it is you know if you are eating muscle then it's it's the same so we clearly showed that you know skin removal is, is not uh, beneficial in this case again we did that at the you know farm level individual farm level with skin on and skin off fillet uh, for many different chemicals uh, lipid content pcb levels chlordanes ddt all the legacy pesticides and also dioxin like uh, chemicals including dioxin no big difference in in removing skin we compared again with the, you know the other studies that published so we can see scotland most of the north um, uh, west uh, northeastern atlantic you know the scotland european side salmon from those farms had much higher levels than you know the the, the striped bars are our study main uh, you can see the levels are lower than in um, you know scotland and and some of the european countries alaska obviously the lowest concentration you know because this is wild salmon not the farmed salmon uh, so that that's the kind of difference we found for pcbs uh, you know many of the chemicals wet weight basis or lipid weight basis however you compare uh, still you can see that uh, you know the northeastern atlantic samples from europe had much higher levels the four, of course our study clearly showed that um, you know uh, farmed salmon um, had higher levels um, and of course there is inter farm very intra farm vari variation in concentrations and also skin removal did not affect uh, the concentrations it's all those kinds of information so what the final conclusion was to the consumers that there is a significant intra region regional variation in concentrations of this depending on the farm you know even within main what you know each of those farms were doing in terms of their practices can have differences in concentration so the consumer's ability to accurately predict and minimize their exposure through the labeling is limited because still consumers uh, you know for me i i want to have a clear information you know what, what are the levels if they tell us there is no pcb and if i measure that and can prove that it is there is no pcb that is a good proof but uh, still consumers are left with a lot of you know uh, uh, questions about the safety of salmon and we also showed that skin removal did not result in uh, the reduction in persistent organic pollutant concentrations and as i told you this is one of the striking finding at the time organically raised norwegian salmon had 
higher levels than you know, farmed salmon uh, from Maine and Canada. So we compared our results with the, the 2004 study. By the time the Canadian aquaculture uh, or, or, or salmon farmers changed their practice. Before they were feeding salmon with uh, fish oil or all the animal waste. They just grind it, make fish meal out of it. So if, if you are in a cattle farm, you know, you, you take the meat and whatever the leftover, you grind it, and that is fish farm, uh, sorry, fish meal, and, and, it's, and it's sent to fish farms for feeding. Or fish, you know, all the fish oil, you know, uh, aquaculture industry, take away all the gut, everything from the fish, grind it, again, feed, feed the fish. And that's how the, the many farms were practicing those days. But after our study, they know that the fish meal itself contained lots of these chemicals. So then they changed to vegetable oil instead of fish oil. That reduced the concentrations of uh, these chemicals in uh, salmon. So by the time we did our study, we, we could see some reduction in the persistent organic pollutant concentrations in Canadian fish farms. So with that, um, so this is the story about the Norwegian uh, organic farm, uh, organic, uh, organically farmed salmon. The Norwegians were kind of very upset. Um, they were trying to figure out what's going on. And that resulted in a lot of communications with Dr. Shah, with us. How did you do this? How did you do the analysis? They did the analysis. Later, they found out that it is mislabeling. They acknowledged that. So we wrote a letter to invent the journal in which we published our paper in 2006, saying that the Norwegian farmers, this is what they did. There was some mislabeling issue that was acknowledged. And uh, you know the new owners of the processing facility began buying conventionally raised salmon from various farms and selling it at higher prices, higher prices under Norwegian organic label, right? It's conventional form, but they labeled it that way. And, and this was all like, you know, clearly discussed with uh, our um, partners from Norway, trying to figure out what's going on. And of course we submitted this letter to Environmental Science and Technology, the journal, to show that this is what had happened with Norwegian um, organically formed salmon. The Norwegians followed. After that, they, they conducted several studies. In fact, even there was a study published a couple of years ago. And of course, they cited our paper, Shaw et al, saying that, yeah, Shaw et al found high concentrations in 2006. And we have seen now five-fold reduction in concentrations compared to you know, the 2006 study. So this helped many of the uh, farmers, the salmon farmers, to make some changes in, in their practices so that you know, the, the contaminant level uh, could be reduced. Uh, so you know, this is something you can see how the science can reach the producers. In other ways, you can say industry, right? To help them gain some knowledge and change their practice so that the consumer in the end is safe, right? So this study really took uh, a lot of attention those days. Um, and then we also analyzed polybrominated diphenyl ethers. These are the flame retardant chemicals. These are the chemicals used in uh, computers, TVs, cell phones, uh, to, to, to make the materials uh, from not catching fire. Because if we keep the TV uh, turned on for 12 hours, it can get heated up, right? So if you use a flame retardant chemical, it won't catch fire. That, that's why the, the, the chemicals are used. But you can find those chemicals in everybody's blood. We are all exposed. Uh, and, and of course, they are also in salmon uh, and also they are in the food chain. We can find them in seals, uh, dolphins, in all kinds of animals. Um, again, the same study here repeated for measuring these uh, flame retardant chemicals. And again, we found the same, almost similar story here, the Norwegian, uh, you know, the topmost, the blue is the Norwegian for much higher concentration, right? Compared to the uh, salmon from Maine, Canada, and also, the, uh, and also Alaska. And more detailed study between farm comparison. So again, we, we were trying to tell the farmers and the consumers that 
the, the, the chemical concentrations are depending on the form, the practices that they follow. It's, you, you can't just make one label that, that can tell you everything. Right? It has to be detailed. Um, so that, that's the kind of message that we wanted to convey from, from this Salman work. So again, it, it was all about taking the message clearly to the consumer. Scientists like me, like Charlie mentioned briefly, I'm a lab scientist and most of us like me, when we publish the paper, we think I'm done with my work. I published, I'm done. I have to move on to the next project. But Dr. Shah, after publishing the work, her work started really. Her work really started after we published the paper. No, now I have to reach out to the consumers. I have to reach out to the industry. I have to reach out to the policymakers. She spent a lot of time doing that. That really made me feel whatever I do in the lab, there needs to be a, a bridge to, to take it to the consumers, right? In the end, all the research that we do, if it's, if it's in a scientific publication, means nothing. You publish 100 paper, 1,000 paper, like Charlie said, yeah, I have published a lot of paper, but if it doesn't reach to you, to me, after, you know, I have been in this field for 35 years, doesn't satisfy me. But now that after working with Dr. Shah, these are the things I have learned, that the science should reach the public, should reach the policymakers, should reach the industry, so they can make some changes. I, I'm not blaming industry, because of course industries are important for the economy, but sometimes they don't know what they are doing, right? So they need, they also need some education. Uh, so research, if it can reach, you know, all these levels that makes a big impact. So again, with the Salman, we talked about, you know, the conclusion is that labeling uh, sometimes, uh, if it is not well done, <laughs> it's not, going to protect the consumers from the toxic chemical exposure. And, you know, the industries can take efforts. If, if they know where the problem is, they can, you know, make efforts to reduce the contaminant levels. That's what the Canadian industries did immediately when they knew that it is the feed that is making the concentrations in salmon much higher, they, they, they switched to vegetable oils, then the levels went down. And sometimes, you know, contrary to our conventional wisdom or paradigm, removing the skin is important for salmon? No, not, not necessary. I would say because it's, it's the muscle fat that is accumulating this chemical, not the skin, skin fat. Sometimes some people say skin can be even better because it has some uh, more omega-3 fatty acid related kind of uh, things. Um, so again, we kind of concluded the study with, you know, uh, uh, labeling and uh, public disclosure of the real, what is really happening in terms of concentration. Unless people do, you know, like us, the institute like this, do the study, we will not be knowing all these things, you know, more detailed study. And for us, there is no hidden agenda. Uh, we were not responsible for any uh, funding agency that we should be following what they tell us to do or Nothing for us, our mind is all about doing good science. For me, it's all about doing good science and for Dr. Shah, taking that message clearly without any bias, talking to the consumers. That's all we did. And uh, you know, that's what in the end makes us happy, successful. And, and, and you know, we, I'm really proud that I was being a part of this study. We did a lot of claim retardant studies. After that, we published a paper, uh, a review article about these chemicals, polybrominated diphenylators, the flame retardant chemicals. Looking at what we did in many marine organisms, we were predicting the future of these chemicals. We can do that, you know, with, with the trend studies. Samples collected from 1975, samples collected in 2000, you can see the blue one, human samples, human blood. 
increasing with, with time it, it was going up and these kinds of trend studies can also capture attention of uh, industries the policy makers if, if the chemicals keep on building in your body with time at, it, it will reach at, at some level that you know maybe creating lots of problems for for for, for, for the people right so with, with the, the chemical level were increasing in seals, dolphins, uh, crabs, fish, all kinds of things. Most of them collected from Maine. We did a study and we showed that all keeping on increasing with time. So then this study was very helpful also for the industries to make some uh, policy decisions. So with that, that's all about the Salmon study. Okay, now you know what we did with Salmon, how we reached consumers, industries, and policymakers. And then I want to talk a little bit about the SEAL study. Um, so as I told you, I started with, I started contacting Dr. Shah for uh, marine mammal samples because when I read this institution, you know, on the website, Marine Environmental Research Institute, I thought that that maybe uh, some SEAL or dolphin samples that are archived that I can take and measure these chemicals and publish papers. Uh, so 1999, it didn't happen, but then Dr. Shaw was interested and in 2003-04, like a lot of, I mean, dolphin seal die-offs along the main coast and, uh, you know, a lot of mass mortalities. Many dolphin seals died those years, you know, in 90s, uh, 80s, lots of them. Many died of some diseases and we know that their immune system is compromised. And the immune system can get compromised when you're exposed to many chemicals that, that we use, like PCBs can suppress the immune system. So then we did some studies with seals. Um, so again, another thing that I, I was uh, really very admiring of Dr. Shaw is paying attention to details. Every study, she went to the depth possible. It's not like, superficially, yeah, I got some samples, I, I analyzed them, I published paper. It's not that way. See, kind of get into the hearts of everything about details of the study, you know, the, the policy implications, everything about it. That's another thing I really cherished about, you know, every study was done with utmost detail possible. That everything that you can learn about it. So this study is about, again, the flame retardant chemicals because in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, this is the talk of the town for, for, for scientists, uh, policymakers, industries, flame retardants used everywhere. Everybody is exposed and the levels are building up every two years. If you have five PPB today, in two years, you will have 10 PPB. In another two years, you will have 20 PPB. 20 nanogram per milliliter of your blood. It was kind of, you know, exponentially increasing in our bodies. So that's why, you know, we had more studies with flame retardants. And, and of course, Dr. Shaw's work helped many industries to ban many of the chemicals. Of course, main legislation work done here at this institute on flame uh, PBDEs. So this particular study, we collected fish samples from uh, the main coast, mostly around um, Blue Hill uh, areas. Uh, also, this is the seal, um, the range, home range for seals. They migrate almost uh, to uh, New Jersey to the entire main coast. So we collected seal samples in this particular study. Uh, and then uh, the fish samples, because seals eat fish, we wanted to look at the food chain, how these chemicals get magnified in the food chain. Higher, higher the tropic level in the food chain, more accumulation. We are also in the higher tropic level in the food chain, right? So we accumulate lots of chemicals by eating, you know, uh, fish and, and, and a lot of uh, meat uh, products. So what we found in this study is that, yes, so you can see the concentrations given in nanogram per gram. So if you take one gram of fish, this many nanograms, nanogram is small, but again, if you are eating, say, 200 gram of fish, you know, that's almost close to a microgram. And if you are eating, you know, fish meal every couple of weeks, 
you know, milli, it, it turns into milligrams, so you're exposed to milligram and over lifetime, maybe grams or even kilograms, depending upon, you know, what chemical, what fish, what, what you do. And, and th this is just one chemical. We are exposed to thousands of chemicals every day. If you take, that's what I do. Uh, my work is mostly focused on human exposure. So we take blood samples, urine samples, uh, human specimens and look for chemicals. And, and you can see, uh, you know, chemicals that we use in our cosmetics, uh, chemicals that are present in our contact lens, um, you know, chemicals that are present in computers and, uh, uh, of course, pesticides, and needless to say, you know, we eat a lot of uh, salad, um, all pesticides, so you can find many pesticides, many of those kinds of things. So when you put them all those chemicals together, what kind of effects they can have to wildlife and also humans is, is uh, that's what we are kind of interested in. You can see here the harbor seals, almost thousand times higher concentration than that found in fish, right? So they kind of, sorry, uh, almost uh, 100 times. Uh, so they magnify in the food chain because the seals eat a lot of fish on a given day. And, you know, several tens become several hundreds and, you know, they kind of magnify. We also found in that study, one of the classes of flame retardants called decobromodiphenyl ether or BDE-209. What industry did in 2001, 2002, one of the most highly produced and used is the DECA BDE. They didn't stop that because it's a big business. The small ones, they said, oh, we got it off it. Don't, don't bug us. Don't bother us. You know, we, we are out of business. But it didn't happen for BDE-209. Because in those days, there was no good analytical method to measure BDE-209. It was a very difficult chemical to measure. So it kind of escaped the scrutiny. Uh, so then nobody measured it because we couldn't measure it. And then the industry you know, they thought that BDE-209 is not a problem because obviously we, we couldn't measure it. You know, they took it in a different way. But then this, in this particular study, you know, by mid 2000, 2000s, 2004, five, we all had a good method. And we showed that BDE-209 is also present in fish. And again, this is the first study to report occurrence of BDE-209 in seals and fish from the Northwestern Atlantic coast. That has resulted in, many of you might have seen already, of course it's from Shaw um, you know, Institute website. This has resulted in legislative action uh, you know, by the main legislators. They thought that the DECA BDE is now, actually the levels that we found is one of the highest level found on a global scale. You know, it's got sales from, Europe uh, at similar levels uh, of what we found in seals for arbor seals from uh, the main coast, very high concentration. Uh, so that led to uh, again legislation. Dr. Shah stayed with the work, took the work all the way uh, to to reach whoever she has to reach. A scientist like me would not have done that. As I told you, for me, if I publish a paper, my work is done. But unfortunately, I don't know how many people would read scientific paper, right? Scientists would read, Charlie probably would read, but then it, it has to reach the public to have the impact uh, for the work that you do. That, that, that's something I learned. And now I try to do more of that, uh, you know, to take my work to the public, but sometimes it's not easy. You need to look at the big picture sometimes. It's not just these chemicals are affecting you. You have to think many different, these things in many different ways. What are the benefits of using DECA BDE? What are the benefits of using flame retardants in a product that can catch fire, right? So the industries, that's what they, that's what they say. 
If you don't use flame retardants, many of your things will catch fire. You will have lots of fire related deaths in this country. How then you will convey the message of chemicals in your food? And then if you don't use that chemical in your product, it will catch fire, then you're at the risk of uh, you know, having fire in your home and, and, and probably a lot of people will die because of fire. So balancing that act is not easy. So the communicating the science that we do is not simple. It needs a tact. Uh, for me, as a scientist, do the best science. Even if you stay with the publication, it's okay, but we need to find a partner like Dr. Shah. Please take my science a little further. I want to do more science, but I want to do the best science, but please somebody take this science out to the public, out to the policymakers, out to the industry, so we can do something about it to make changes in the benefit of uh, improving the lives of our future generation. Right. So again, the legislative, again, it's a lot of verbiage, sorry. I didn't mean uh, for you to read everything, but see, again, the bill passed by the main legislator about uh, banning DECA BDE in some products. All of these legislations, uh, legislations resulted from the work that we did here. We did also perfluorinated compounds. Now Maine is passing a bill to stop PFAS in many consumer products. The chemicals that we measured, published in 2009, actually, almost 12 years, we found them in seals. Again, a first study. Before this study, nobody had published a paper on perfluorinated compounds in seals or fish from the main coast. Um, but we, we did find. Uh, but now, uh, legis uh, main legislation is uh, passing, uh, is, is they're passing a bill to stop PFAS in many consumer products. It's happening now 12 years after. What we found in this study, another interesting thing, the pups, seal pups had much higher concentrations of PFAS, the chemical used in nonstick coating, uh, sometimes, you know, the Gore-Tex and, and the ski jacket, but seals have them in their liver, sometimes very high concentrations, even higher than what we have in our uh, bodies. The pups, the babies have much higher concentrations than the adults. So during lactation, during baby birth, the placental transfer. So the fetus is exposed from mothers to the fetus. And during lactation through milk, the babies get exposed. They can have long lasting effect because I, I'm in the department of pediatrics. He saw me the first, he saw the first slide because I'm more interested in children. Chemical exposure in early life stages can have significant effects later in their life. So protecting our children uh, from chemical exposure is very important. Um, so again, you see some of these chemicals can uh, cross placental barrier. Uh, they can uh, pass through the milk and, and, and uh, you know, the, the young ones can have much higher concentrations of these chemicals. So we did lots of this interesting research. First off, you know, first report of PFAS contamination. We showed that the harbor seals have 1,388 nanogram per gram wet weight. These concentrations are similar to those reported from the US Pacific coast, California coast, for example. And we also found some unusual perfluorinated compounds. Now the legisl legislation is mainly for PFAS one chemical PFOS, but there are many other PFAS compounds. What we found in seals is some of the chemicals that are currently not being scrutinized, but they are also found in the environment. They can also accumulate. Uh, it's, it's currently kind of es escaping the um, regulatory scrutiny, but I'm sure at some point, you know, those chemicals will also come to the picture and. Uh, legislations will be made on those kinds of things. So then I want to come to the humans. So from salmon, seals, humans, uh, again, a study, it's not related to firefighting chemicals, uh, flame retardants. So at the time, uh, Dr. Shaw was more into firefighting chemicals, 
the industry was always pushing no no our chemicals are safe these chemicals are important protecting the lives of lots of people from uh, fire related deaths so then you know we were accumulating lot of evidences so to show that these chemicals are indeed uh, problematic they can cause thyroid hormone related problems they can cause cancer they can suppress immune system they they can cause neurological problems lots of evidences the hundreds if not thousands of scientific studies supporting that fact that these are you know these chemicals can have an effect then this study uh, is is about firefighters so then if flame retardants are used in many of the products the firefighters may be using some of the products that in fact the the gear the firefighters you know they wear uh, the the gear at the time of firefighting they all have flame retardants in them so obviously they you know their clothes uh, can be a source of exposure all those kinds of things. then when the fire is burning they produce uh, dioxins the dioxins are cancer causing chemicals uh, they produce brominate dioxins and those chemicals have never been studied before people people uh, from the 1970s have studied lots of chlorinated dioxins because those were the chemicals used in uh, vietnam uh, used during vietnam war the agent orange the army was deploying herbicides in in forests in vietnam to destroy their forests because the enemies were hiding in the forest shooting all our um, you know helicopters and planes so the agent orange the herbicide was applied all their uh, you know the forest to deforest and the herbicide contained chlorinated dioxins so at the time many veterans had cancer from exposure to chlorinated dioxins so the chlorinated dioxins were widely studied but not brominated dioxins brominated dioxins can be formed when you burn bromine containing chemical uh, material so we also measured for the first time brominated dioxins in the blood from firefighters san francisco firefighters and pbde is the flame retardant levels were also elevated in firefighters and why we kind of focused on firefighters is because of the cancer rate firefighters have very high levels of all different types of cancer prostate cancer testicular cancer kidney cancer liver cancer lung cancer you name the cancer the firefighters have i don't know probably five times 10 times more than what you know the normal population would have and we know that they are exposed to lots of chemicals from their job the occupation that's what motivated you know for us many of us including dr shah let's do a study because we should be looking at highly exposed populations so we can make the link much stronger when 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 we are looking at people who are highly exposed and there is a disease the link can be much stronger and uh, that resulted in this study but only 12 firefighters provided uh the samples for the study is a pilot study because sometimes these studies can be expensive and also difficult dr shah i remember coming to albany several times to meet with firefighters association to talk to them to convince them guys you are all exposed to lots of these chemicals from your job we should do it we, we want to do a study please give us blood samples and we will report back to you and then we want to do a larger study you know getting some funds from you know federal government or from from foundations there is also firefighter cancer prevention foundation there are because they know that they have high rates of cancer in the country and and there is a foundation to 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 do this study and to help them you know wearing protective gear but you know these people are very tough Dr. Shah, this exact same words he used to me. Canon, these firefighters are very tough to convince. And when I go talk to them, and, and even talking about the protective gear, they, they don't care. You know, they don't want to worry about it. They just want to go without any mask. Everything they get inhaled with all these toxic chemicals. And uh, you know, now we see that they are highly exposed to these chemicals. You know, see, so went to all this. Uh, of course, this is from a picture from Maine. lots of wordings from dr shaw herself because the way she writes something i i really liked it the message there is no hidden agenda we want to do a pure science and we are doing it in the interest of protecting you not for me not for you know anything it's to protect you 
So again, these are all some of the uh, quotes taken from Dr. Shah's from publication, also sometimes communication. After we publish papers, we kind of uh, write, the reviewers, you know, read the paper, write comments, and we, we have to review it those sometimes you know negative comments and from her, her own words about you know how what our study really uh, means you know to, to the firefighters to the people so as i told you before many scientists like myself we stop after publication but dr shah became very active after the paper is published but because now she has kind of a weapon you can call it the publication is like a weapon right we have the data to show that what is really happening and what does it really mean to convince you know people and then go from there uh, so that is something i i really enjoyed talking with that so you know taking the knowledge uh, into policy she did a lot of work on that she met with many Policy maker, you know, Chuck Schumer is, is very active in the environmental area in New York. If you're in New York, people will know Chuck Schumer. Uh, she, she was, uh, you know, um, uh, I was also involved in a lot of tes testimony uh, before government and legislature for many things. Uh, she did, uh, Dr. Shah did uh, uh, testimony before Minnesota legislature, Maine, of course. Also, this is with New York, uh, Children and Firefighter Protection Act. This, this came out after our publication, the firefighter study. So the one paper, uh, even that study, uh, Chuck Schumer actually said, the paper is, 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 is kind of the important paper uh, to alert the nation about the dangers of firefighters, uh, you know, facing uh, the exposure to this flame retardant chemical. So the publication is like a weapon, you know, sometimes to show uh, but I would rather, uh, I, I would have stopped with publication. I would not reach after that. But, you know, th th that's why institutions like this is really very important. To me, this is, honestly, this has to be the future. I, I, I wish people understand um, because there should be a bridge between scientists and, and the public. The public can be inclusive of policymakers and the industry. And, and there should be, uh, uh, you know, a, a communication. And I think institutions can play a role. And, and of course, the government is realizing that. NIEHS, now many of the research proposals we submit, they ask for where is the community engagement core. So we are, we are looking for institutions like this to get involved because government also realizes that science should reach the public. After all, research, you know, if, 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 if I'm getting federal government funding for my research, it is taxpayers' money. I'm using taxpayers' money for doing my research, but that research should reach the public back. That, that's how the federal government is now thinking. So they're always looking for how the research can be, you know, translated or taken to the common public. Uh, you know, that's, that's becoming very important these days. So Chuck Schumer, Schumer basically said, Dr. Shaw is the grandmother of research on chemical exposure uh, and uh, cancer among firefighters, the science driving our safe chemicals legislation to protect all Americans. So it, it's a quote from him actually. Uh, he is also very active. Picture taken at the same time, uh, this is uh, she is now the uh, mayor of Albany, uh, and uh, you know Chuck Schumer here, Dr. Shaw talking about uh, the flame retardant chemicals and, and things like that. He did a lot of work with flame retardants jointly, publishing many papers. Uh, Linda Brubaum is the was the director of NIEHS, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. So in the beginning, when we started this paper, risk versus benefit of flame retardants. It was just uh, Dr. Shah, uh, myself, and uh, one more actually, Th three of us were planning to write this paper. And when we kind of drafted, many wanted to, to be a part of it, including the NIHS director, Linda Brunbaum. She is also very active in uh, flame retardant research. And as, as I told you, Dr. Shah went to 
many places talking about the work, uh, you know, the, the uh, reaching, you know, uh, their work to, to other places. And, and very recently, last three or four years, more, she became more interested in plastic exposure. And that's where the scientists now, uh, we are also doing a lot of plastic chemical exposure, Charlie has done some. Uh, you know, if you're talking about marine pollution, it's all about plastics recently. But obviously you can expect, we are exposed to lots of plastics also. The food, many food products are packaged in plastic containers. So we are exposed to plastics. So last couple of years, I did a lot of uh, thinking, writing research proposals on plastic exposures in people uh, with Dr. Shah. Um, that, that was last couple of years. This is the, the cover page uh, of that, uh, 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 you know, the, the proposal that we submitted to one of the foundations last year. That was the last time I also saw Dr. Shah. Uh, it was uh, one of the conference calls, Australian Foundation. They wanted to fund a study on plastic exposure in children. They clearly told they have $1 billion in the foundation. And they wanted to give most of the money for plastic related chemical exposure out of 1 billion, maybe several hundred million, I think, for they wanted to dedicate several hundred million for plastic related research. They clearly told. And Dr. Shah came to me, and this is a very good opportunity. Now we know a lot of children in developing countries are exposed to plastics, nothing is done. They, are used, they, they work in uh, e-waste recycling. A lot of plastics are burned. You know, if, if you have a computer, old computer, throw away, goes to e-waste and goes to, you know, some of the developing countries, they kind of uh, burn it to melt the plastic, take the metals away. No protective air, all children employed, exposed to all these toxic chemicals. Nothing has been done. So we thought that this may be a good place. Obviously, the foundation is interested in, you know, focused on high exposures, probably less studied areas, and of course, children. Uh, you know, of course, for me, you know, I am interested in children. I like our children to be the healthiest and the happiest. That is my motto. Uh, nothing else. So you know, so I thought this is a good thing. Let let's do. Uh, so. You know, last few years, Dr. Shah is all about, uh, again, it's a quote from her, given the paucity of data on the children, you know, doing all these kinds of study, this is a timely research that we should be focusing on. So we kind of try to reach at the uh, grassroots grassroot level, community engagement. So in this particular project, we wanted to educate the local community, not just doing research not just taking samples from children, blood or urine samples, looking at all the chemicals, but to educate them uh, and have the community leaders involved and uh, uh, also medical doctors involved, you know, help the children if there are any health problems. We want to look at their health issues. Uh, so at least we, we want to link everything, chemical exposure, health, education, uh, community engagement, all, all those kinds of things. That's what we did with this research proposal, actually. Again, uh, we, we kind of brought in uh, many international collaborators because this study was going to be focused in uh, Ghana, India, Vietnam, because we, I, I have a lot of collaborators. My research is kind of global in nature. I have collaborators in many countries. That's another thing that I enjoy uh, because when you do a global level study, in those areas where people are not paying attention to because their priorities are different. But if we at least do something in those places, create some kind of awareness, after some time they will realize that, you know, this guy has done something, you know, 20 years ago to raise some awareness. So that's something that I also enjoy. So I have collaborators in many countries. Uh, the, even my lab is, you know, at any given time you can see 15 countries represented in my lab. So I'm more like an internationalist, you know, I like people, educate them, train them, they go back to their country and, and do things that, you know, I do too. So we brought a lot of internet, most of them are my former postdocs, students, they went back to their country, they became professors. So we kind of brought them in and, and, and wrote this um, 
grant. So it's a very well written grant. We are still looking for some um, funding, um, uh, you know, agencies to support this kind of work. Uh, again, you can see a lot of pictures from those countries, from uh, our collaborators, you know, who are uh, doing the work. They, they're already doing some work, but not at the level that it will have an impact uh, globally or, or even at the local level. So we want to make it, uh, you know, to a level that it can reach the community, it can reach the politicians, it can reach, uh, uh, you know, um, to a level that something can be done, you know. Uh, that's what we were trying to do. You can see a lot of children employed in those kinds of places, plastics uh, exposed, their health, if you look at their health, you know, conditions, very bad. Many, you know, even at the childhood having cancers, thyroid problems, all kinds of things. They don't realize that it is because of the chemical exposure. So it's that kind of awareness that we have to create that, you know, these chemicals can harm your health. That, that fundamental knowledge is still not there. Um, so that's what we were trying to do. Again, microplastics is one of the, you know, when plastics particles uh, break down into smaller pieces, create microplastics. That's what we are now kind of doing uh, some work. Um, so we kind of recently published a paper looking at microplastics in infant feces and compared that with adult feces. So we, we took stool samples from adults and infants, one-year-old infants. One-year-old infants had 10 times higher concentrations of microplastics than adults. So you will be wondering, I thought, you know, of course my postdoc scientists working in my lab, they made some mistake. And I was later trying to figure out how can this be possible? If you really think about it, one-year-old infants, teethers, plastic, pacifiers, feeding bottles, uh, always hand to, that's the time that they're teething. So textiles, they're chewing textiles. And of course I had a couple of my friends, grandchild, one, I was watching actually one of uh, the grandchild came to my, children came to my home. They placed her on, uh, on the car seat, immediately the strap in her mouth. They kind of, take everything, you know, like hand to mouth contact, they chew on everything, all the plastic things. And that, that's when I realized, okay, it makes sense why they have much higher concentrations of those things. So when we published that paper, um, it, it, get up, it got a lot of attention. So the infants, one-year-old infants, this is the exposure dose we calculated from what was found in their stools. So 83,000 nanograms, so 83 microgram every day, or per kilogram body weight per day. So if the infant is 10 kilogram, for example, it is 830 microgram, almost a milligram. One milligram of plastic, you, you know, your baby is eating every day. And in fact, we have some calculations about how many milligrams of plastics we consume every day. We have done some studies on that. Um, you know, it's all milligram quantity. Sometimes we don't know ourselves how much of plastics we are ingesting every day. Unless scientists like us measure these chemicals in, in, in blood or, or stools or, uh, you know, urine or something, we don't know what we are exposed to. Uh, sometimes I myself, I, it, it can be personalized also. One time I was measuring parabens. Parabens are antimicrobials used in many cosmetics. And of course, over-the-counter drugs, because it prevents your over-the-counter uh, over drug or cosmetic uh, from um, uh, growth of you know, the fungi or bacteria, because they are antimicrobials. They prevent the growth of fungi in your cosmetics or over-the-counter drugs. So I was, all are exposed. You, you know, if you take urine samples, I can, I, I can bet uh, everyone will have that antimicrobial. It is shown to be estrogenic. In, in fact, a study from the UK reported paraben exposure linked to breast cancer. If people are using antiperspirants, deodorants, obviously lots of parabens, and that can be linked. 
that was the study done by a, a British um, cancer epidemiologist. Uh, so then I was looking at myself, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an organic person. I was very proud of myself. I don't touch all these chemicals. Let me see, I will not have parabens. To my surprise, I was shocked. I had very high levels of paraben. I went crazy, where that could, ha it could happen. Then I later realized that it was the over-the-counter medication that I was taking that day for my headache. I, I went, this is not good. So, you know, sometimes we don't know all these products that we use contain chemicals that can have an effect on your head. So unless we, you know, do these kinds of things, it's hard to know. I know I'm kind of, I went ahead, oh God. Okay, so what we can do, what we can do. Um, I thought that I will be only talking for 30 minutes. Now it's almost uh, more than uh, an hour. So, you know, there are lots of opportunities here uh, with the collaborations with the Institute. To me, I, I think we should have to have more of soil institutes all over the country because we scientists should be talking to or working with these kinds of institutes when we write research proposals. In fact, I, as I told you before, uh, the federal government expects community engagement, community involvement, citizen science. They use all different names. It's all about what Dr. Shah did working with me as a, as a collaborator. That's all, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of talked in a different way, community engagement, all, all those kinds of things. So to me, you know, like science, we do here, most of the time I stop here publishing paper, but now we need this, you know, bringing uh, the science to the community. So the institutions like this have a lot of role. Uh, I'm really excited. I really like to help and work with Charlie and of course others in the Institute because uh, this is what we should be doing moving forward. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I really didn't know. I have taken this long. I sometimes I get carried away. <laughs> I wanted to finish it in 30 minutes, uh, but. Thank you for staying and uh, you know, I'm sorry you know, for taking too long. I think you can see it's really hard to fit the entire history of this very complex dynamic special relationship into even close to an hour. I think we could probably have a lecture series. Yeah. Maybe next time I'll talk about what I'm really doing <laughs> in some science, but I will be get, I will be carried away even more. You know, maybe <laughs> like you said. <laughs> No, I, I like Blue Hill. You know, as, as I told you, it's 20 years in making. I, Dr. Shah really wanted me to be here so many times, but every time there was something, we were busy doing different things, but uh, I'll be very happy to be back and, uh, you know, I'd like to be working with you all. Great. Nice. Yeah, so we have time. We have an engagement in about 10 minutes, so we have maybe time for literally one question. That's be very short. <laughs> all right, never mind. I guess we can't get questions. Email me. My card is at the front, sure. and I can pass on questions to Dr. Post, Dr. Tom. Um, and then, yeah, please take my card at the front. I'll pass those on, and then sure. we'll have them back at least 20 more times. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. I'm sorry we went a little long, but I think that was all over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.